Drago mi je da vas vidim u ovoliko broju i posebno mi je čast da večeras možemo predstaviti austrijskog filozofa i teoretičara psihoanalize Roberta Fallera. Prije nego ga ja predstavim i prije nego on počne, najprije će nam se obratiti gospodin Georg Lack, direktor Austrijskog kulturnog foruma, koji je omogućio da večeras imamo ovdje predavanje. Hello everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so, I was already introduced, my name is Georg Lack, I'm the director of the Austrian Cultural Forum here in Zagreb, and it's a, it's a pleasure to see so many of you here in this uh, philosophical salon, the Philosophischer Salon, uh, at the ZKM. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome Professor Faller, who uh, is currently teaching at the U University of Vienna, or the, the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. Um, and as, as it was said before, we are uh, supporting this um, lecture here tonight at the ZKM. Uh, special thanks also to Sereshko Horvat, with whom we've been uh, cooperating already on a, on a number of times. So, thank you for coming and uh, enjoy this evening. Quite a year Thank you. So, I will also turn into English uh, and switch to English and say just a few words uh, about Robert Fowler. Uh, currently, he's a professor of philosophy at the uh, University of Applied Arts in Vienna. And uh, I think uh, the last time we had the opportunity to, to hear and see him in Croatia was, I think, exactly 10 years ago. Uh, when he presented his uh, studies about interfacility, which is a term which I could say so made him famous in the academic but also broader world. Uh, as you probably know, Slavishic has used this concept very often later. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, Robert Paller has published uh, several books, I think five or even six, uh, The Illusion and the Under, which was published, I think, in 2002. Uh, at Surkamp, uh, and the last book, he, in the meantime, he published also other books, but the last book he published is uh, Zweite Welten und andere Lebenserexiere, which in, in English would be uh, Second Worlds and Other uh, Life, I don't know, maybe you will explain it. <laughs> but, uh, so, and this is actually uh, the topic of tonight's uh, lecture. Uh, so, uh, I will leave you the floor, and later we will have a discussion with the video. Thanks a lot for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad to be here again, and I still remember vividly the uh, wonderful discussion that we had after my last lecture here in Zagreb. Um, well, actually, I never was in the predicament to say the title of my last book in English, but uh, I think it would go Second Worlds and Other Life-Enhancing Substances. <laughs> um, not drugs, uh, but uh, <laughs> life-enhancing uh, drugs or drinks. So, I would like to start with a remark made by the Italian writer Natalia Ginzburg, who wrote in her book The Imaginary Life two wonderful sentences which gave me a lot to think. The sentences go like this. Why do we not live the way that we dream? And why, nevertheless, do we still have to dream? These are the two sentences. Why do we not live the way we dream and why do we nevertheless still have to dream? This is the question that Natalia Ginzburg raises, or the two connected questions. Uh, by coincidence, I later found an answer given by John Lennon, who in his song Beautiful Boy says in his lyrics, Life is what happens to you while you are busy making other plans. Life is what happens to you while you are busy making other plans. So I think the philosophical consequences that can be drawn from these lyrics are very rich. In the first place, they 
of course, tell us that what we regard as something provisory, like for example, life as a kind of waiting room for the doctor, this, what we regard as provisory, is in fact already the surgery. What, this, what happens there happens here, but we just expect it to ha happen elsewhere. But we can also read this quotation from Lennon into another direction. In the reverse direction, we could say even that without a false expectation, no life would happen. So only the fact that you are busy making other plans makes your life happen. So a deviant expectation, a deviant plan, is a condition for life. And here I think we encounter for the first time what I would call the necessity of second worlds. Second worlds are precisely those plans we have to make in order to allow for a different life to happen. So, in this quite tricky structure, we can find now several possibilities. The first would simply be that we do not make plans, we do not develop expectations, and then, of course, no life would happen. The second possibility, which is the sad case of many times, is that we develop expectations, that we make plans, but then a different life happens. And so the true life appears as the wrong life to us, as the false life, the life that does not correspond to our plans. But the third possibility, I think, arises from knowing precisely that. If we know that a deviant plan is a condition for a life that does not look like the plan, uh, then I think we are able maybe to trick our fate and uh, expect one thing and then secretly be happy with another thing. In fact, if you look around, I think you can see most people knowingly or unknowingly pra practicing this principle. So they are either on the stage of the second or on the third possibility. If you look, for example, at the love life of your closest friends, you will probably quite quickly find out that almost, almost nobody lives the way he or she considers it to be right, or nobody lives the way the plans go. So, for example, people who are very um, reliable partners dream of sidestepping and uh, having a more exciting life. Those who have the exciting life dream of stability. Uh, those who have indulged in serial monogamy dream of permanent monogamy. The, the best friends who engaged in permanent monogamy envy those who are engaged in serial monogamy and so on. I even once encountered a couple. Um, they divorced about the question whether they wanted to have a child or not. The lady wanted to have a child, the husband did not want to have a child. They found this uh, not negotiable and separated. Soon after that, uh, the man became father with another woman, he was a happy father. The woman uh, married another man without a child, uh, they became happy without a child. So, very often in couples, we can also say that the partner represents, in a way, your second world or your, your deviant wish or your deviant life in place of you. Lacan has put this in the nice formula that woman is the symptom of man. <clears throat> I am telling you all this, which you probably all know, um, on one particular reason, because I think that under the historical circumstances that we live in, these principles have been widely forgotten. So, for example, a kind of postmodernist code of conduct in sexual affairs uh, encourages us to reveal our wishes 
And if we say we want this and that, and then we negotiate with our partners who say that they want other things, and uh, then we negotiate and then we get the best out of it and make compromises and then we will get what we want. But what if precisely our wish is not to reveal our wish? How should we then proceed according to a postmodernist code of conduct? Or if you think of experiences that you can easily get from watching TV series, very intelligent series like Sex and the City, for example, completely <coughs> underestimated under, among intellectuals, to my judgment. Um, very often in Sex and the City you have a scene where people who had just dinner together are now confronting the question, should they spend the night together? And it is very significant, I think, that this can never be explicitly uttered. They cannot say, should we now spend the night together? Uh, but they have to say, uh, wouldn't you like maybe to come with me for a coffee? So again, here you have the necessity of a second world. If you would not make a busy other plan, then life would not happen. If you would not rely upon coffee, then no night would be spent together. We can also read this the other way around, maybe for other cases. We could say that explicit sexual offers then would not allow for this life to happen. So, for example, imagine an exhibitionist opening his coat if you look at this exhibitionist, take a testing glance at what you can see and say, okay, that's interesting, I will come with you. Of course, the exhibitionist will end up in pure horror. This will be anxiety arising. Uh, this is precisely the reason why he opens the code. He wants to block your desires off and fend off. It's a defensive move, but if you act according to uh, the first world of this practice, then you destroy the first world of this practice. A very interesting structure, which only at first sight appears to contradict these principles, you can again observe in Sex and the City. Maybe you still remember the wonderful character Samantha Jones. She is the emancipated woman who has this idea that women now have to live just like men and that's the best what they can get and she tries to do this and this means to have many men to to have relationships only based on sex and that's fine and so on and so she finds at some point some a very perfect partner that extremely fits to her standards this is also a man who just, I mean, he's a man who just uh, uh, thinks that it should just be about sex and they agree very much about this point. And so in this agreement they form a very stable relationship and they make appointments uh, by saying obscenely, uh, should we fuck tonight at 8 o'clock at my place? Um, so you could now of course argue that this contradicts my principle about coffee and so on. but. Um, I would claim that here uh, again the principle is at work because if two people love each other because the other has an equally cynical relationship with, with regard to love, then this means that precisely this love between the two cynics is not cynical. Uh, and therefore they have to hide something which appears more vulnerable to them than even sexuality and therefore again saying should we fuck tonight at eight at my place uh, uh, is a second world to a world which they cannot reveal uh, in order for it to persist a kind of tender uh, solidarity in uh, the conviction that love should just be about sex and nothing else. So this is the supplement which is precisely something else in this love relationship and they have to defend it. So again, even pure naked sexuality can be an overcoat for something else, a second world for something else, and it's a condition of existence for this something else. As a kind of postmodernity, 
postmodernist predicament, I would claim that this oblivion that we need second worlds in order for the first world to appear and to happen uh, shows itself very often in uh, the impossibility of postmodern subjects to construct themselves. You know, everybody is now interpolated to construct him or herself with regard to every aspect of life, sexual identity, sexual orientation, political orientation, ethnical uh, identity, uh, whatever. Uh, what is interesting here is I think that, according to my experience, I very rarely encounter people who have sufficiently constructed themselves and say, now I finished five years ago and now it's fine, I have now my perfect construction. But apparently this constructing world can never be ended and people seem to suffer from this endlessness, but uh, on the other hand they also somehow seem to defend this endlessness as if it were their most precious treasure. So if this is not to be finished, I think uh, there is one reason for that, because, which is that the one perfect thing that they want to be cannot be found. So it is precisely the fact that this construction that they try to build up, this perfect construction, is always just a one-floor construction. It does not contain a superstructure, a second floor. So they construct everything, but they have the feeling that everything should be on the first floor. They cannot construct themselves as, like, for example, being a man, but dreaming of being a woman. Uh, that dream should enter into the construction, but then the second floor lacks, and therefore the construction is not perfect and doesn't work. Another uh, example of postmodern predicament in private life, I think, is the fact that partners in postmodernity uh, tend to total transparency. So I observe in recent uh, crime television programs like the German Tatort, which probably you may know, which is a kind of classic in German television culture. Um, in these crime uh, television programs, very often I observe since like five or ten years a kind of standard situation. The police inspectors come to a house, want to speak, for example, to the husband. Uh, husband and wife are present. They say to the wife, can we speak uh, to the husband alone? Husband says, no, no, please go ahead. Uh, my wife and I, we don't have any secrets towards each other. This is a quite, uh, at least in, in this density or in the, uh, in the fact that it occurs so often, I would claim that this is a recent typical phenomenon that people uh, declare proudly we don't have any secrets with regards to each other and that seems to be a kind of proof of the sincerity of their love life. But um, again, I think uh, it is no wonder in such a relationship culture that people find those perfect transparent partners all of a sudden very boring. And so uh, we have this kind of postmodernist uh, asexuality that occurs in couples. Um, and my colleague uh, Svenja Flasspöhler, who has written a beautiful book on jealousy, has claimed that uh, we should introduce a third element, an opaque element, into this total transparency in order for desire to uh, continue. And there should at least be a kind of fantasy of the third person, the, the secret lover of your beloved. If you cannot fantasize about this, uh, your love will uh, cease to exist. So it is very important, Svenja Flasspöhler claims, that you have some passages during the day where you do not exactly know where your partner is, you do not have his or her coordinates uh, and schedule and then you, this allows you for the second world of a fantasy what may be my partner is now in some secret relationship and happiness to get the partner back later is in, tremendously increased by fantasies like that. Another typical contemporary example occurred to me uh, in autumn 2012. Maybe you have also noticed this debate about the cover of Vogue Om, uh, a 
beautiful cover photograph which showed half-naked young woman and a half-naked young man in a kind of passionate embracing each other. And all of a sudden there was a group of people claiming that this represents violence, even rape maybe. And, uh, and there was a huge discussion that Vogue should not publish this cover. Again, I found this very strange and in a way alarming about postmodernist uh, thought. In the first place, it was not quite clear to me that violence was there actually present. There were no real visible signs of violence. But even if so, if, if we can claim that they were attacking each other or breaking the other's will, would you really think that such an image would encourage people, readers, to commit such acts of violence? Or is it not rather probable that such an image that shows people dreaming of violence in their love act encourages other people to dream of violence in their love act, which is not violent. So I think here comes again the question, does postmodernity allow individuals for dreaming or uh, do we also already have to censor our dreams, if not our acts? Against this position, to say individuals are totally homogeneous, what they dream they will do, uh, I think we can mobilize uh, important and valuable experiences. We can see very often that dreaming one thing precisely prevents people from doing that thing. So if you think, for example, of the most opportunist politicians that you have seen in the last years, uh, choose some examples. Do you think they were dreams, dreaming of being opportunist? Or was it not precisely those politicians who thought that deep in their heart they were revolutionaries or friends of the people or at least uh, the smaller evil under given circumstances, that precisely those were the politicians who made the nastiest compromises and uh, went for the utmost opportunism? Or if you think of artists or writers that you know, is it not true that every kitschy reporter, writer of kitschy novels, dreams in his heart to be a true lyrician, a true poet, uh, just uh, not able due to market conditions to show his uh, uh, refinement? So is it not necessary that all these people have this second world of dreams in order to support a different life? And if the kitsch guy would dream to be a kitsch guy, he, this would prevent him from doing the kitsch. This is what Sigmund Freud states with regard to dreaming when he says, with reference to Plato, that the good people are those who dream the bad things. The bad people are those who commit the bad things. And I think, uh, again, you can see the ignorance of these simple principles in postmodernity. For example, as soon as some American German pupil uh, shoots as, at his classmates, uh, which happens apparently quite often in the United States, uh, then one question that police and social pedagogues immediately raise is what is on the computer of this AMOC shooting pupil? And then they find maybe some ego shooter games and then they immediately draw the conclusion, okay, this pupil has shot on the ego shooter and then of course he had this idea he could do that also in reality and one day he went to school and then he shot uh, his classmates and therefore we should prohibit uh, ego shooter games on the computers. Again, I would claim that this is utmost neglect of the principle of second world and uh, it tries to cut the chain at a link which is maybe not a causal link or which is maybe the wrong causal link in this chain. Because, of course, the first 
question should be why is school such, such a stressy place? Why are pupils regularly so humiliated uh, that they have this outburst of violence? Second question, of course, why do they so easily get firearms? Uh, if we can cut it on those conditions, maybe we would be more likely to find solutions for these problems. But the computer game problem should probably be tackled from the opposite side. We should rather ask ourselves how long maybe has shooting on the computer prevented those children from shooting at other children? How long maybe uh, could they somehow get satisfaction or get uh, relief from playing something in order not to do it in reality? And how many pupils maybe never start shooting at their comrades precisely because they have a chance to get this relief from shooting at the computer? So if we find somebody who shot on the computer and then shot his classmates, we should not draw the conclusion that this was the reason for it. We should rather draw the conclusion that the reasons for shooting were so strong that even playing on the computer could not anymore prevent this guy from doing it. So otherwise um, we would fall into a false conclusion just as if for example, in car traffic, we would state that today, strangely enough, dead car drivers after accidents only sit in cars which have safety belts and airbags. And so that must, the re must be the reason for that death. Uh, and therefore, we should, f you know, uh, we should prevent, we should forbid safety belts and airbags, then car drivers will survive. So we would then regard that, which protected them, but not strong enough. Uh, as the cause for the accident. As you will know, um, this whole second world principle with regard to art has been uh, formulated by Aristotle in his Poetics under the notion of catharsis. So showing the people things in art, letting them dream bad things and letting them act out unsolved passions mm -hmm allows them to decontact those passions, those affects, and prevents them from acting them out in real life. That would be the cathartic function um, that Aristotle describes with regard to tragedy, but also with regard to music, for example, when Aristotle says it would be nice if all the people could listen to refined music, but unfortunately, some people have to live a pervert life and those people have to have pervert music in order to act perversion out and not uh, let, it, let it predominate their lives. <clears throat> Very often, of course, we try to find other people who act out what we do not want to act out. I think this is a principle of talk show television. Uh, and this distinguishes the presence of sexuality, for example, in talk show television from the presence of sexuality in like 70s movies. So sex has somehow disappeared from movies to a certain degree, but entered talk show. But by this shift of mediality, I think a different social relationship has established. I would claim that spectators who watched movies like, for example, Last Tango in Paris or um, Trio Infernal, they regarded the behavior of the characters maybe not exactly as a model for their life, but they somehow took it maybe as an inspiration and thought, well, I might not have it in such extremity, but it is something that could enhance my life a little bit and uh, at least dreaming of it to a certain extent would make my life better. This is not the case with the talk show guest who explains that he's a necrophiliac or that he commits sadomasochist acts with his own mother. Uh, in such cases, spectators do not identify to this uh, 
spectacle and they do not have the feeling that oh yes maybe I should also ask my mother or maybe I can find also a dead body and <laughs> try. No, this is not, uh, not at all the case but spectators of talk show like to see that and they look there in a fascinated way but they are also very relieved to have a kind of black sheep at which they can point with their fingers and say, look how, how obscene and how perverse this is a necrophiliac. I'm very glad that I'm not so. <clears throat> so I think this is a very interesting shift in perspective with regard to the heroes and heroines that we have now on our television screens. They are not anymore a source of inspiration, but they are black sheep that we uh, let dark passions live in our place in order not to act them out ourselves. Of course, postmodern television also presents us terrible examples of people who at first sight again seem to contradict our principle of second worlds. Is it not true that postmodern television, for example, shows us people who are really totally primitive, for example, those young guys who commit coma drinking, you know, no, not the slightest trace of refinement in them, they just blow away their heads with enormous amount of alcohol every Friday, or totally shameless people, these people from the lower classes that now engage in this strange pornographic culture and expose it immediately for television. Or even total idiots. This has been one of the triggers of the Bologna reform at the university. The official propaganda was that now an enormous mass of idiots will come to the universities and they will not understand what university could be and this multiplicity of choices, what they can choose as, as lessons and seminars that will completely go beyond their capabilities and therefore we have to regulate this all very strictly so that all this a huge amount of idiots can be satisfied and uh, gratificated with a university degree. So, or we have other idiots like screen characters like Ali G, character invented by the British comedian Sasha Baron Cohen, who has this juvenile rapper Ali G, who apparently doesn't know anything. Um, and he always makes these interviews with prominent people, for example, the president of the United States Rifle Association. And then Ali G asks this man, uh, is it true that rifles have got a bad reputation these days? And the president says, yes. And then Ali G says, uh, did then anything bad happen to people due to firearms? And the president says, yes, unfortunately. And then Ali G says, when did this happen? So <laughs> here again we find a character which is totally simple, or also the other character that you probably know, Borat, the man from Kazakhstan who does not have any culture whatsoever and um, well-meaning, tolerant Western people give him good advices for good behavior. He's very grateful for the smallest advice, kisses the advisor, but still it does not work because uh, the legs are so big that they can never be filled with good advices. So all these examples seem to show that in postmodernity at least we have to do with real idiots, with real simple people who do not have the slightest second world, who just indulge in utmost primitivity and homogeneity. <clears throat> Yet of course, due to what Sigmund Freud has told us, we have to discern the gaze of another in this simplicity. Or to put it into other words, we should claim that every simple being has got a second being or an observer who wants the first to be that simple. So, for example, if we have Austrian television, a program uh, Friday Night Fever, then some television teams from the capital Vienna go happily out and explore the provinces and go to a di discotheque in the province and want to see the barbarians, how they behave on their Friday nights. 
And the barbarians are very sensitive for this feeling of inferiority which is conferred upon them when the camera comes. And then, of course, they start to, to rebel against this expectation and they somehow act it out in a provocative manner, I would claim. They, what they do is actually somehow to show this elitist Viennese people, if you regard me as a primitive, then I will show you a real primitive, so that you are really shocked. <clears throat> the same happens, of course, also in school, for example, when the teacher regards a few pupils as stupid, then the stupid pupils immediately emerge and answer more stupid than they have ever been. Also in these gestures, uh, uh, a kind of, a kind of uh, rebellion against the expectation of other has to be read. In theory, this has been nicely explained by the British cultural theorist Stephen Greenblatt in his book Filthy Rituals. He starts this consideration with a historical example where a group of Indians in New Mexico invited, middle of 19th century, uh, an officer of the American army who was a kind of hobby ethnologist and they invited him to take part in a secret ritual that they had never revealed to a white man before. So this man was very honored and pleased and came there with big expectations. But what, was, what he was shown then was very disappointing. Uh, the Indians indulged in a terrible obscene ceremony where they uh, acted with excrements and drank urine and, um, and said if they had been able to do it outside they would even have done more. So it was totally disgusting. Uh, but soon the anthropologist got the idea that they also somehow mimicked uh, the ritual of a Catholic mass. And so there was a kind of relationship with their observer. He got this idea this did not happen independently from his presence as an observer there and it, it was made up for his eyes. And uh, even historical examples pop up to him and also this already this American officer had this idea that there's a kind of um, a stereotype through history that some groups often start acting rituals with excrements with regard to another group that regards them as inferior. That's the idea of Stephen Greenblatt. So wherever we have a kind of social conflict where one group regards the other as inferior, the inferior group starts to protest often by using excrements and somehow stating to the other, you regard us as barbarians, now we show you what real barbarians can do. Uh, a kind of recognition of the inferiority, but also a kind of rebellion against this inferiority at the same time as Greenblatt states, uh, I think, perspicuously with regard to this behavior. So I think this uh, is the important principle from which we have to learn here, also with political respect. To put it into psychoanalytic terms again, we would have to say that the so-called primitive is an effect of transference. The other transfers on him the role of the principle and his primitivity is a theater made up for this gaze of the other. He acts within the imagination of the other or within the illusion of the other. Therefore, this seeming homogeneity or primitivity can occur. Otherwise, it could not occur. Every primitive would have a second world. The second world only disappears as soon as a second spectator arrives and allows him to play the role of the primitive. This is, I think, very important if we look at other primitives that occur today, even without excrements, but if at universities now we sometimes encounter the typical Bologna student, that is also a kind of Indian with a secret ceremony that he performs for us. Uh, I, since a few years, I sometimes at some universities encounter students uh, who ask strange questions that they would not have asked 15 years ago. Uh, so if I tell them that 
as a work for their exam, they should choose one quotation from one theory, um, either those on the reading list or some other from their own reading, and that they should comment about this quotation in a certain way, according to a certain method. Then some students come nowadays and say, excuse me, can you tell me on which quotation I should do this? And I say, uh, you can choose the quotation completely freely. You can do it either on Adorno or on Benjamin or on Freud or on Lacan. Just choose the one that you want to comment upon and you can do it. But then they say, no, but I don't want to make a mistake. Can't you just tell me which one exactly I should take? Maybe the older uh, Comrades among you remember what would have happened 20 years ago if we told our students you must do it on Adorno and not on Benjamin. They would have said, you fascists, you force us into the wrong choices and so on. But today you have the opposite student, those who want to be totally obliged and get full prescriptions. But again, I think we should not fall into the trap to think, well, students nowadays are like this, what can we do? We can only pursue Bologna reform and ECTS and prescribe them everything and then they will be happy. No, we have to regard them as artificial Indians. They perform this for our gaze. Uh, they perform this because they feel somehow that we will love them for that performance. If they perform the primitivity that we transfer upon them, they will get loved by us. Therefore, this is a kind of claim for love, actually not for um, an indication of the reading list. So I think this is the reason why we should not allow any political apparatuses to treat anybody as a homogeneous person, that why we should fight against all these political measures taken in the name of primitive people, those students who do not know anything and for whose sake we have to make these universities reforms, or all other primitive people who uh, are, for example, so vulnerable in their religious feelings that we have to remove all caricatures or all movies that could offend their total sensitivity in religious matters. So I think all these seeming primitivities are staged and artificial phenomena of transference and we should not fall into the trap to uh, regard them as original and uh, utmost conditions for our behavior. Um, and therefore, I think we should also start fighting those political institutions which have established in the name of those primitives, Bologna reform, ECTS, uh, measures taken for the vulnerability of people with regard to their religious feelings, sexual identity, ethnic identity, whatever. Um, we should not allow any apparatus to treat anybody as such a primitive being. And I think this is important uh, due to a certain political development that we have uh, experienced. I think many apparatuses have cropped up in the last years precisely based on this agenda that they have discovered some primitives and that they have to do something now for the sake of those primitives. I think this corresponds to a political situation where the state has shifted from a function to support the individuals to a function where the state claims health from the individuals. So instead of supporting us with regard to infrastructure, social security, pension, uh, education, the state now uh, claims something. It becomes our duty to be healthy. It's not the duty of the state to support us, but our duty to be healthy. And I think such a state uh, starts to play on the vulnerability and the sensitivity of individuals. This is the immediate consequence. And for a long time, I think we have taken these policies as emancipatory. Uh, it appeared that there was no, nothing wrong, that politicians were so concerned about these weak people, about these stupid people, these uneducated people, these vulnerable people. So it seemed to be okay that somebody took care of the weakest in society. But in a way we were blind for the fact that this 
actually this addressing people as totally weak, totally vulnerable, totally unable to overcome their stupid identity even if for a few centimeters and uh, let it behind themselves for a little distance, uh, that this was the utmost offense. And I think this is the clever point in what Sasha Baron Cohen has done with Ali G and Borat. He reveals precisely that this so-called postmodernist tolerance is the utmost racism. That people say, well, we have now a guest from Kazakhstan and you know they don't have any culture there and we have to be very polite and tell them everything. So this is only at first sight tolerant, but of course uh, silently this is utmost racism, that nobody ever says, listen Mr. Board, uh, tell me how do you do this in Kazakhstan at home? You must also have a solution for, uh, for I don't know what, but you, you must have one. Tell us how it is there. But this is never claimed from him and this is precisely postmodernist tolerance to, to, under, to suppose that the other does not have anything uh, to show. So I think we have to state that playing on the sensitivity, on the vulnerability of people is an offense against those people and it causes a severe damage. It is the damage of those people's pride. If I treat you as completely vulnerable, that means I would treat you as totally unable to overcome your vulnerability in public space and uh, behave as uh, civilized people. I think this is the stake at this postmodernist shift from the supporting state to the prohibiting state, uh, that the prohibiting state plays on the vulnerability of the people or at the claim of the vulnerability of the people and at the same time totally destroys their pride. You can see that also under many other so symptoms for example, when people are only allowed to express their feelings but not their thoughts, for example. They are not called as political citizens, they are not interpolated at, uh, uh, as adult people who can say something which is relevant for society. No, they are only interpolated as suffering, stupid individuals which can only express the feelings of their suffering. So, I think what we should keep in mind here is regardless of the particular question that in a lot of post-political measures today this is taking place, that postmodernist politics plays on the vulnerable bourgeois and does not allow this bourgeois to proceed to the proud citizen. So, for example, regardless of how you think about the smoking prohibitions. But is it not an offense against adult people to put, you know, this, this uh, 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 black uh, frames on the packages of the cigarettes, you know, uh, warning people that cigarettes can kill you or something? You know? Uh, only adult people can buy those cigarettes, no? not, uh, not children. They have made sure that no children can buy them. But now adult people are told by politicians uh, that cigarettes are dangerous. Is this not this an utmost offense? I mean, regardless of how you stand with regard to smoking, but, but you as adult people are addressed like children. Yeah? And it's precisely those politicians that we, or our majority, uh, has elected. And we had to be adults in order to elect them. But now they treat us like children and tell us uh, that we should not uh, smoke, that this is dangerous. As if we had not known that. No? Uh, beautiful book by the American writer Richard Klein, Secrets are Sublime. Richard Klein states there, it is completely erroneous to think that we had never known that cigarettes are so dangerous. If we had not known that they are dangerous, Klein says, we would not have smoked them. We smoked them precisely because we knew that they are dangerous. So, I think we have to take this into account that a kind of postmodernist politics has shifted from a supporting state to a prohibiting repressive state and that this shift has been made possible 
by interpolating individuals as vulnerable beings or interpolating adult people as if they were children. In the name of such idiots, most repressive measures have been taken and social standards have been dismantled in the name of such idiots. So this is also what I have called postmodernist pseudo-politics, because I think uh, we can say that this politics always relies upon a certain trick or cheating. It is precisely those politicians who did not stop the big players, who did not regulate the financial markets, who start regulating the private behavior of individuals uh, for the sake of their health. So I think this we have to see as a connection. Uh, the, this politics makes a shift from the questions for which is it, it is there to questions for which it is not there. And in, instead of prohibiting the powerful forces and uh, putting them into rational limits, they start to, put, to impose irrational limits upon individuals. So the a politics which is impotent, either unwilling or un, are not capable of limiting the big players, starts to become hyperactive in putting chicanes upon individuals. I think this is extremely damaging as a type of mass education, because I think here uh, what is it that people learn from this education? It is the fact that they are only heard if they complain, they are only lovable if they are weak and vulnerable, and I think that allows for a type of people to emerge who are totally vulnerable, total idiots, total complainers, and uh, who are keen to obey orders and those people who, which are getting produced by these pseudo-politics are people who always hate the happiness of the other. That's what this politics tells them. Be careful if the other is happy, this will be on your own detriment. So this politics of prohibition and good advice, uh, this pseudo-politics uh, is a thoroughly desolidarizing politics. It desolidarizes society precisely by the fact that it always presents the happiness of the other as a threat to your own happiness. And then very often it starts to tell the freedom of one person ends where the freedom of the other person begins and therefore the repressive state has to put in barriers so that these freedoms do not collide and so on. But I assure you if you read for all classical philosophers about freedom, you will learn one thing, that it is not freedom which ends where the freedom of the other begins. Uh, you can find that in all philosophers, whoever you take. Um, what ends where the other person's thing begins is not freedom, it's vulnerability or complacency or idiocy maybe. But freedom is a more complicated thing. I think uh, freedom is more structured like pride. You cannot live in pride if the other does not live in pride. So among people who do not have honor, you do not have honor. And I think the same goes with freedom. Among people who are not free, you cannot be free. So therefore the freedom of the other is a requirement for your own freedom and uh, the pride of the other is a requirement for your pride and also the happiness of the other is a requirement for your happiness. And I think we should be aware of this also with regard to the shift of perspective that we have <coughs> observed in culture in the last 15 years, because it is now precisely those things that we loved like 10, 15, 20 years ago, which today we fear and hate. Some people among you may still remember what happened if 15 years ago you heard somebody asking, uh, does it disturb you or does it embarrass you if I smoke a cigarette? 
there were people existing at that time, which is not so long ago, 15 years ago, who, who would answer then, oh, please go ahead, I don't smoke myself, but I like it if you smoke, it looks so elegant and it smells well. Some of you may remember this, no? Older colleagues um, of my age may remember to have heard that. And I think this should be presented in a museum today. This should be shown to school children who may not believe that this has once happened. This looks totally impossible today. Even if I tell my students, they are sometimes totally surprised and can't believe it. And I think uh, here, this is a question which is worth philosophizing about what has changed so much. What has changed so much that this gesture, this gesture of social solidarity or benevolence with the happiness of the other has totally disappeared and nobody can even imagine anymore that it existed once. What is the reason? I think we can explain it again along the lines that I have tried to line out for you. I think as long as we regarded the other not as a vulnerable, stupid individual, but as somebody who behaves like an adult when coming to public space, who behaves like a civilized person, able to let his stupid identity, vulnerability, inclinations and everything behind him, uh, as long as that was the case, as long as we met the other as an encounter of two civilized people, we were able to regard the smoking of the other as a part of his or her role in public space. Then we would have perceived that as such that we would say, okay, the, the other smokes because he's now in public space. This belongs to his or her role in public space. The other feels obliged not to bother me with his nervosity and his uh, tics, but smoking gives him a kind of relaxed attitude. He becomes slower, calmer. That is more relieving for me. So the other does it in order to satisfy my view on him. Uh, the happiness of the other is an advantage for my happiness. That was the case, I think, 15 years ago, and that was the reason why such utterances, please go ahead, I don't smoke myself, but I like it if you do it, were possible. Today, on the contrary, I think we get more and more trained by this propaganda of the vulnerability of weak individuals to look at the other as a purely private person. The other is constantly just a Borat for us, and probably those Borats only smoke at home in their private spaces in Kazakhstan, but now they come even into our spaces and, and, and endanger our health. Please, police, uh, prevent them from that. So I think this is what has shifted, and there I would claim that the level of encountering the other or the possibility of encountering the other as a civilized individual is a requirement for happiness. Uh, only if we are able to see the other as a civilized citizen, we can allow him for his happiness and only then we can also indulge in our happiness or share his happiness with the other. So I come now to my last conclusion. I think uh, what I've tr been trying to tell you about this uh, principle of second worlds and this structure of pseudo-politics which have established precisely by ignoring uh, the existence of second worlds in individuals, I think this leads to a, an advice for a political strategy. We all know that in this last financial crisis, it was very difficult to identify the true enemy. As opposed to former class struggles, it was very difficult to identify those people who really profited from the changes. So there were 99% apparently agreeing on that what was going on was bad. Even managers on Wall Street sometimes gave a few dollars to the occupant people and uh, said, yes, deep in our hearts, we are in solidarity with you. Uh, even Jean-Claude Juncker agreed uh, recently with my colleague David Brecht on television that money cannot make people happy and deep in his heart he would also find this neoliberal politics that he has contributed to not so good and so on. So where is the enemy if even the enemies speak this second world language? 
If we cannot find the true enemy, I would suggest let us attack his allies. Let us attack those pseudo-political apparatuses who always speak in the name of weak individuals. Because I think they form the second world of the bad world of neoliberalism. This second world constituted of a constant concern of some weak people. This is precisely the second world of a first world which is not at all concerned about suffering of masses and millions of people. So let us attack this nice uh, tender world of vulnerability and being taken care of and then we bring the first world into trouble. I think this is what we can do today. The enemy may sit in the next office. Let's attack those enemies and destroy this pseudo-politics in the name of weak individuals. Then we will get strong individuals who will not bear what is going on today. today. Thank you very much for your attention. But I think with regard to the simplicity which is imposed upon us currently, it is already a very relieving first step to say that there are at least two worlds in every question. But of course you're right that every single part of our life has got a specific second world to it. That already that makes things complicated. But again, I think the important thing is to remember something that uh, the philosopher Louis Althusser has described as a kind of mechanism in social life that if you push one side up, the other side will go down. It's not always that if you push one thing up, everything will lift up, but social reality is uh, constructed like this mechanical uh, uh, reversing mechanism uh, that uh, that you have to look in any question, if I push here, will the other side go down or up? And how many uh, links are there between my point of intervention and the result? So I think at least this idea that in some cases dreaming, do not, uh, dreaming does not bring about an equally bad reality, but precisely, precisely prevents a bad reality, at least this I think contributes to letting us see our contemporary world in a bit more of complexity. Any other questions? Oh, there is a question from the main behind the scenes. <laughs> well, we, we recently had uh, Jim Tamash here talking about the development of the middle class as uh, something that is basically a working class proletariat, uh, not capable of being a real bourgeoisie, which means for production, all of that. But it's not a constant. So, what, uh, 
So do you do you see the middle class as something like arcing to this second world and the first world being the fact that we are mostly proletariat dependent on our wages? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, you're right that this immediately concerns a, a question of class division. But I would claim that it is not always upper classes that address lower classes as babies or children. I think, unfortunately, it is much worse. It is pseudo-political apparatuses of the left who address their own clientele as babies or vulnerable people or students remote from education and so on. So just recall that Bologna reform was not made by the extreme right. Bologna reform was made by social democrats. So uh, very often it is people who uh, profit from their own class who establish pseudo-political apparatuses. More questions? So in that sense, to put it in, very, in a very simple concept, or maybe in very simple words, would you say that uh, this all is one outcome of 86? <laughs> well, I would say that a certain after 68 ideology forms today an ideological support of neoliberal econom economic tendencies. So this would not have been detrimental if we had stayed under conditions of full employment and whatever. But today, under the acting of a very aggressive capital against society, this ideology of be yourself, be authentic, always try to be yourself and so on, becomes a, a very dangerous support of this politics because it allows the state to retreat uh, and not to address the citizens as political citizens, but to retreat to this level of biopolitics and pure repression. And one indication for this I would claim, to my experience, if you look around, who always calls the police first? It is the people who are most influenced by a kind of anti-authoritarian ideology today. So it's anti-authoritarians who today call for the police. What is with all the educated people that we have now? <laughs> Sorry? I... What is with all the educated people that we have now? We are uh, developing into a society that is uh, uh, to great percentage built of people who um, have more and more education. And so, on the other side, there's a lot of educated people who do not have a job then in the end, because obviously, or as it seems, society just cannot absorb or cannot use all those educated people, as it seems now, especially in academia. Um, what is with all the, let's say, brain drain in this sense? What is with, uh, what is happening with uh, all the knowledge that is around but not used? Well, of course, we have to state that education alone is not a remedy or def defense against even totalitarianism or fascism. No? Uh, this happened to very educated people and they contributed a lot to it. Uh, And I think what you describe is one of precisely one of the reasons of those developments also. Of course, it is the, the competition among the increased competition among educated people that has also allowed for certain of these developments to emerge. For example, what I often observe, it's not a direct answer, but I think the, the example um, illustrates the, the dilemma of educated people today. Um, what I often observe is that under the conditions of competition today, we have certain educated people who exactly build their own existence 
on the mistakes that they make. So, for example, I do not know if you have in Croatia uh, a national agency for funding of scientific research. But there's one in the European Union and, for example, in Austria we have one and in Germany there is one. So have you ever tried to make an application with a research program at one of those instances? You will immediately discover that you cannot do it. And why can you not do it? Uh, because everything has been made transparent, so that there is no arbitrarity in some people giving you the project and not to your colleague. No, everything has to be very transparent and therefore the procedure has become extremely complicated. So nobody can uh, understand the procedure and fill in the forms. They are much too complicated. So the only chance for you to, to, to get uh, such a grant is that you know somebody from the inner circle of those who established the transparent forms. Uh, uh, so then you maybe have a chance to, to get it. And that's the reason why, for example, all the universities now hire people who formerly worked for uh, the national or EU research funds. Uh, and precisely the fact that they did not succeed in making the conditions transparent allows for their own existence. Now they are highly paid by the universities in order to tell them how to make an application for that. And I think this is a typical, uh, a typical scheme of many types of application that we face today. And this is a kind of perverted uh, concurrence. These people always win against the other people who do not live on their mistakes. The second word of this, yes, I would claim that precisely those apparatuses who permanently speak in the name of the vulnerable individual, they are a second world of a very cruel first world. So making millions of people unemployed but taking care of their lungs so that they don't smoke unemployed. Uh, I think that is uh, a first and second world together. Yeah? Or another example, a friend of mine, colleague just returned from Colombia. He noticed that three million people there are without uh, uh, hygienic water. Uh, so they don't get clean water, but the government takes a lot of care that they don't smoke. Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, of course. I think uh, the social action. The social action. Yes. Uh, just recall the the quotation of Karl Marx. No, we have to sing to those conditions their own melody, and that will make it dance. And the second world always sings a different melody, and therefore it supports the first world. If you destroy this second melody and sing to the first world its own melody, it seriously gets into trouble. I have a question as well. Thank you. <laughs> uh, before we give the space to other questions. Uh, so you have uh, mainly been speaking about uh, the, if I put the right, emancipatory character of the second world in the sense that uh, if you have a relationship, you meet the second world, you have to imagine that your lover has a lover and so on and so on. Uh, but it brings me back to your old concept of interpassivity. Wouldn't you agree that also the second worlds can be some sort of interpassivity? Not only in the sense that you can, uh, in your imagination, have another lover and then you're doing it actually, or your, your lover is doing it with another lover and so on. But also, if we face the current protests in Turkey nowadays, and you have, I mean, if you go to Facebook, you see thousands of uh, supports and so on, but are the people really getting the support? Or So it's two questions, actually. Uh, what is the specific relationship between the concept of the second world's world and the concept of interpassivity? And the second could, question, could you maybe elaborate the relationship between interpassivity and uh, current protests in the world? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, 
Um, first, I, I think I have to try to explain myself a little more clearly. I did not want to claim that second worlds are emancipatory. I just claim that second worlds are necessary supports of first worlds. So, if the first worlds are good, then the second worlds are emancipatory supports of good first worlds. But if, as in neoliberalism, first worlds are very bad and dangerous for many people, then the second worlds that they have are, of course, a very dangerous support for this uh, dangerous first world. And therefore, we have to attack those second worlds of bad first worlds in order to bring them into trouble. And that's the value of ideolog ideological struggle and political struggle, I think. Um, with regard to the concept of interpassivity, um, it is not so easy to, to make a, a, a short bridge. But at least I can say one thing. If you recall the conditions under which I have tried to establish the concept of interpassivity in the middle of the 90s, everybody at that time in media theory and in art theory was totally fond of concepts of interaction, interactivity and so on. Uh, this has somehow perished, uh, but nevertheless concepts of participation have cropped up instead. And I think uh, with regard to this, we could at least say that also interactivity and participation concept in the art is very often very disrespectful with the observer. They do not regard the observer as an adult critical observer. They regard the observer as a stupid child. You have to somehow to, to make the child active so that the child doesn't make fuss. Uh, that, that's, I think, what, what is a kind of silent, tacit fantasy behind this interactive pedagogics. And therefore, I uh, tried to study the phenomena of interpassive behavior of some people who precisely did not want to participate, who did not even remain passive, but who delegated their passivity and so were for example, glad if the television comedy already laughed in their place, so that they said, so I don't even, I don't have to be interactive here, I don't even have to be passive here, it laughs in my place, that's wonderful, I don't have to laugh here, I have the highest distance to it that I can get. So in this kind of loss of social distance, which does not allow the other to be an adult, but we come so close together that we can only be children and vulnerable idiots. Uh, under these conditions, interpassivity was a study of a behavior that could be seen as a rebellion against this uh, loss of social distance and against the uh, let us say, the degradation of society into a community. I think this is also one of the typical postmodern symptoms that the highest degree of solidarity is only seen in a community, which means that we can only imagine to be solidary with people with whom we share at least one feature. We have the same a rock band that we love, okay, so we become friends on Facebook and we are in a community of friends. So, But we, we have get more and more uh, difficulty to imagine a solidarity uh, which is without any uh, sharing one feature in common. And I think with regard to this, uh, the study of interpassivity was a kind of recall that there is a bigger frame that we have to keep in mind and we cannot uh, establish our solidarities only on the basis of community. We have to uh, claim and challenge society as a whole. Are there any other questions? There is one Thank you very much. Yes, you recall one concept which has been crucial for me, concept by Georges Bataille, which has been crucial especially for my last book, 
um, what is life worth living for, elements of materialist philosophy. And in this book I try to simply to recall this materialist question, what is life worth living for? Um, and I think uh, it is important to recall this question as a kind of materialist psychotechnique which allows you to step back from all these panics that our contemporary propaganda suggests to us. No? We are constantly kept in panic. At one moment health is in danger, the next moment environment is in danger, in the next moment money is in danger and we have too much debts for the coming generations. The upcoming generations is also an idiot who can be very well used in order to make panic. No? For them we have to protect the environment at any price or we have to uh, save money at any price and not get indebted, so everything has to be sacrificed for these other generations. And with regard to those panics where something has immediately to be done at any price, I think it is very important to recall these old questions, what is life worth living for? This allows somehow to transgress this simple framework of anxiety that we are being kept in. And at any time, of course, you can say, okay, health is in danger, maybe, maybe true, okay. So we, it's good to do something for health. But of course we should not do too much for health, because otherwise we will never have a life. It's okay to save your life and to try maybe not to die immediately, but if you do everything just to preserve your life, then you will not have a life at all. And then you will die without ever having had a life. So that's the reason why this question is so important. Is there a life before death? This is the materialist question. And so. Um, here the notion of transgression is important as a first step to overcome those panics. If I may say one other thing here, I think it's also important to note one structural law of pleasure that um, came to me to be quite visible here. I think idealist theories always assume that pleasure were an easy thing. Idealist theories tell that sad story, human beings are just pleasure-seeking animals and only culture and society and education can bring them forward to do a little more for society or coming generations or so, but basically they are all just spontaneous hedonists and stupid uh, pleasure-seekers. But uh, this sounds sad enough, no? but from a materialist perspective this is still a fairy tale. Uh, we have to see that things are even worse. People are not hedonists at all. People fear pleasure. Pleasure is horrible and that by very good reasons. Because if you just think of what makes your life worth living, you will immediately encounter difficulties. You know? Alcohol, yes, of course it's great at some moments to drink, but of course it harms your liver and it uh, damages your brain and the next day you will not be able to work so well. And if you uh, have sex, okay, it may be great, but of course it's also a bit disgusting and, uh, and, and it's socially problematic and so on. So maybe better not have sex sex, not to get troubles and so on. But even harmless pleasures like listening to music, no? uh, but this is waste of time. Or just going for a walk, waste of time. So in every pleasure that is really worth living for, you have to acknowledge that there is a very bad and detrimental dimension and you cannot cut it out. If you cut it out then you have beer without alcohol and things like that which are totally banal and do not bring you uh, triumphal feelings of pleasure. So whenever you experience really great pleasure this is based on an act of transgression. You transgress your 
everyday silly uh, economy of taking care not to spend too much money, not to embarrass anybody, not to waste time and so on. This is okay for every day, but in some moments you have to overcome this rational principle and spend money, be generous, give gifts to everybody, invite a lot of people, uh, have sex regardless of the consequences and so on. And if you do not do that, again, uh, without these transgressions, life will not be worth living. But the clue here is, and that's the political issue here, that alone, left to your own individual devices, you will not be able to do that. Individuals are not able to transgress. People alone at home are quite reluctant to drink alcohol. Some do not even want to eat if they are alone. So what do they need? They need a kind of social command. They need some friends coming by and say to me, Robert, it's enough, you have worked enough tonight, but now you come with us and drink some beers. Don't be a spoiled sport. So this brings me out and then the beer in my hand becomes a proof that life is worth living for. This is not always uttered so clearly, but sometimes uh, you go to a nice bar and you have dimmed light and very good cool jazz and so then a silent voice tells you now don't behave like a child, don't order mineral water. So, no? uh, it's clear now you have to behave like an adult person even if you don't find whiskey so great but now you have to drink it and it will feel, let you feel great and so on. So this is the social dimension of pleasure. We need this kind of social command in order to transgress our individual profane economy towards a kind of a sublime experience. And uh, this is why public space is so necessary for individuals in order to have access to their own pleasures. Otherwise, if we destroy public space, if we do not tell the individuals, do not be a spoil sport, uh, if we tell the individuals, please tell us your vulnerability, then they are immediately hostile against pleasure, they cannot claim pleasure anymore, and that makes them reactionary, obedient, envious individuals, which are uh, very uh, supporting authoritarian and repressive politics. Hi, how would you comment that, that um, the ultimate fear is not pleasure, but death, in the sense you know, of uh, not having time, enough time to do all the things that you would like to do? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, you are completely right. Um, this is the other side of the question, what is life worth living for? If you put up this question, of course, you face death. You face death in the sense that you ask yourself, what will I have wanted to have done when I die? I will die and before there are a few things that I probably want to have done or experienced or tried. If you indulge in the idea, I will never die, only then you can say, okay, pleasure, yes, but maybe later. But if you say, okay, one day I will have died and then it would be a shame if I had never tried a cohiba or never sucked a single malt, uh, then uh, you are facing death and you are approaching pleasure. And I think what we are today dealing with is a kind of ideology that suggests to the individuals kind of fantasy of, as Max Weber would have put it, inner worldly immortality. So if you don't smoke, if you drink, don't drink alcohol, if you don't have sex uh, and if you always call the police when somebody embarrasses you, then you will never die. Huh? That, that's <laughs> and I think this fantasy has got many sides to it. One of the sides is also this uh, suggestion that you have to experience your own infinity. You are, if you are truly yourself, you are like an infinite individual. Therefore, the new uh, uh, small cars uh, can be ordered in like 120 different colors. So that's an in infinity of choices that somehow suggests that you are an infinite individual. And um, 
I think this is also one of the phases of this fantasy. And in order to accede to pleasure, in order to become a political citizen, we somehow have to have a position of humor with regard to ourselves and look down upon us and say, well, we are finite individuals in every respect. We will die after some time, but also our pleasures are, are finite. We do not need a whole ocean to swim in in summer. A very small lake is enough in order to be beyond our capacity. So we do not have to fly to a remote ocean in order to have it as a whole. Uh, there's enough water for us to, to drown. And so uh, if, if we adopt this humorous position with regard to ourselves and not indulge in this narcissistic fantasy of immortality and infinitude of, of your own being, uh, then we become accessible to pleasure, but then we are also able to transgress our stupid identity and look at it from a position that does not pertain to it. And you know, that's, um always has some kind of road brain. And I would like to remind of the book from the 15th century, which you certainly know, it's De La Boise, uh, Voluntary Slavery. And why do we agree to it like this? And why, why, why do we go for this something which is um, describable to us? And there's also a man that you have mentioned earlier, I know the, the context that you are um, uh, involved in his work. And this is the sad point that you have mentioned, deep-rooted self-destruction. And whatever that we do and develop as some kind of narcissistic, we should continue living to eternity. We develop all kinds of practices, even political practices, who are destroying us and damaging us. So this is not a question, it was some kind of <laughs> um, reminding us some tribute to all of us here. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yes, of course. I mean, it's quite obvious, precisely those ideologies which suggest our immortality, our indestructibility, are contributed to our uh, inner worldly destruction and, and, and detriment and unemployedness and so on. This is quite obvious. Um, maybe with regard to De La Boiti, I would like to say one word which might let my position also appear a little more clearly. I think with regard to the problem of freedom, there are two historical positions in philosophy. One tradition is started by De La Boiti, and I think his immediate follower is Immanuel Kant in his uh, essay, What is Enlightenment? And many Marxists, like Frankfurt School Marxists, have followed this tradition. Um, the basic line of this tradition is that lack of freedom is based on a lack of appropriation uh, of freedom by the individuals, of a lack of subjectivization by the subjects. People are free, but they do not take their freedom and they regard it as a strange object. There's an appearance of strangeness to it and that makes them unfree. But with regard to contemporary ideology, I would say this is precisely our contemporary ideology. It constantly bombards us with injunctions that seem to pertain to that philosophical position. It says, take your freedom, take it, do it, be yourself. You are not enough of yourself. Try to become totally yourself and so on. Appropriate everything. And with regard to this, I much more sympathize with another tradition which uh, I think uh, has roots in uh, ancient philosophy, but which is clearly expressed by Spinoza, uh, is the position that says people are unfree precisely when there is a surplus of feeling of freedom. So they are slaves when they feel too much to be free, when they feel to be free in actions in which they are not. And I think this is the philosophical remedy against the ideology of our times. We should rather 
uh, reckon that we are not always free in our political actions. We are sometimes supporting things that we would not want to support, but by taking ourselves as autonomous, spontaneous actors, we blind ourselves against our own slavery. And that's exactly, I think, the trick that this contemporary ideology plays on and makes us slaves who feel very free. And I think that can only be criticized by a Spinozian uh, type of thought. So, maybe if there is a last question, we can keep the space for it. If not, uh, I would invite you all to join us somewhere in the city for a drink or two. I'm not sure what, what are Robert's plans. But exactly the command that culture requires, <laughs> yes. The culture is clean. So, uh, I would like to thank you all for coming. I would like to thank uh, ZN Theatre for uh, giving us the space, and I would like to thank the Oysterreich as Kultur Forum to practice my German, and I would like to thank Robert Fowler for being with us in Zabi. Thanks a lot. Thank you.